The morning had dawned clear and cold, with a crispness that hinted at the end of summer. They set forth at daybreak to see a man beheaded, twenty in all, and Bran rode among them. Nervous with excitement, this was the first time he had been deemed old enough to go with his lord father and his brothers to see the king's justice done. It was the ninth year of summer, and the seventh of Bran's life. The man had been taken outside a small hole fast in the hills. Rob thought he was a wildling, his sword sworn to Mance Raider, the king beyond the wall. It made Bran's skin prickle to think of it. He remembered the hearth tales old Nan told them. The wildlings were cruel men, she said, slavers and slayers and thieves. They consorted with giants and ghouls, stole girl children in the dead of night, and drank blood from polished horns. And their women lay with the others in the long night to sire terrible half-human children. But the man they found bound hand and foot to the whole fast wall awaiting the king's justice was old and scrawny, not much taller than Rob. He had lost both ears and a finger to frostbite. And he dressed all in black the same as a brother of the night's watch, except that his furs were ragged and greasy. The breath of man and horse mingled, steaming. In the cold morning eras his lord father had the man cut down from the wall and dragged before them. Rob and John sat tall and still on their horses, with Bran between them on his pony. Trying to seem older than seven, trying to pretend that he'd seen all this before. A faint wind blew through the whole fast gate. Over their heads flapped the banner of the Starks of Winterfell. A grey direwolf racing across an ice-white field. Bran's father sat solemnly on his horse, long brown hair stirring in the wind. His closely trimmed beard was shot with white, making him look older than his thirty-five years. He had a grim cast to his grey eyes this day, and he seemed not at all the man who would sit before the fire in the evening and talk softly of the age of heroes and the children of the forest. He had taken off father's face, Bran thought, and donned the face of Lord Stark of Winterfell. There were questions asked and answers given there in the chill of morning, but afterward Bran could not recall much of what had been said. Finally his lord father gave. Caitlin had never liked this godswood. She had been born at Tully, at River Run far to the south, on the Red Fork of the Trident. The godswood there was a garden, bright and airy. Where tall redwoods spread dappled shadows across tinkling streams, birds sang from hidden nests, and the air was spicy with the scent of flowers. The gods of Winterfell kept a different sort of wood. It was a dark, primal place, three acres of old forest untouched for ten thousand years as the gloomy castle rose around it. It smelled of moist earth and decay. No redwoods grew here. This was a wood of stubborn sentinel trees armored in gray-green needles, of mighty oaks, of ironwoods as old as the realm itself. Here thick black trunks crowded close together while twisted branches wove a dense canopy overhead and mishapen roots wrestled beneath the soil. This was a place of deep silence and brooding shadows, and the gods who lived here had no names. But she knew she would find her husband here tonight, whenever he took a man's life. Afterward, he would seek the quiet of the God's Wood. Caitlin had been anointed with the seven oils and named in the rainbow of light that filled the sept of River Run. She was of the faith. Like her father and grandfather and his father before him, her gods had names, and their faces were as familiar as the faces of her parents. Worship was a septon with a censer, the smell of incense. A seven-sided crystal alive with light, voices raised in song. The Tullys kept to God's wood, as all the great houses did, but it was only a place to walk or read or lie in the sun. Worship was for the sept. For her sake, Ned had built a small sept where she might sing to the seven faces of God, but the blood of the first men still flowed in the veins of the Starks and his own gods were the old ones, the nameless, faceless gods of the greenwood they shared with the vanished children of the forest. At the center of the grove an ancient weirwood brooded over a small pool where the waters were black and cold. The heart tree, Ned called it. The weirwood's bark was white as bone. 
its leaves dark red like a thousand blood-stained hands. A face had been Daenerys her brother held the gown up for her inspection. This is beauty. Touch it. Go on. Caress the fabric. Danny touched it. The cloth was so smooth that it seemed to run through her fingers like water. She could not remember ever wearing anything so soft. It frightened her. She pulled her hand away. Is it really mine? A gift from the Magister Illyrio, Visory said, smiling. Her brother was in a high mood tonight. The color will bring out the violet in your eyes. And you shall have gold as well, and jewels of all sorts. Illyrio has promised. Tonight you must look like a princess, a princess, Danny thought. She had forgotten what that was like. Perhaps she had never really known. Why does he give us so much? She asked. What does he want from us? For nigh on half a year, they had lived in the magister's house, eating his food. Pampered by his servants, Danny was thirteen, old enough to know that such gifts seldom come without their price, here in the free city of Pentos. Illyrio is no fool, Visory said. He was a gaunt young man with nervous hands and a feverish look in his pale lilac eyes. The Magister knows that I will not forget my friends when I come into my throne, Danny said nothing. Magister Illyrio was a dealer in spices, gemstones, dragon bone, and other, less savory things. He had friends in all of the nine free cities, it was said, and even beyond. In Vaes de Throck and the fabled lands beside the Jade Sea. It was also said that he'd never had a friend he wouldn't cheerfully sell for the right price. Danny listened to the talk in the streets and she heard these things but she knew better than to question her brother when he wove his webs of dream. His anger was a terrible thing when roused. Visories called it, waking the dragon. Her brother hung the gown beside the door. Illyrio will send the slaves to bathe you. Be sure you wash off the stink of the stables. Call Drogo has a thousand horses, tonight he looks for a different sort of mount. He studied her critically. You still slouch. Straight in yourself, he pushed back her shoulders with his hands. Let them see that you have a woman's shape now, his fingers brushed lightly over her budding breasts and tightened on a nipple. You will not fail me tonight. If you do, it will go hard for you.